Welcome and good afternoon. Um, I am Tracy Resvani um, from the Resvani Law Firm, but I'm also a board member of the DC Consumer Rights Coalition. Um, I want to have a special thanks to the DC Bar's Antitrust and Consumer Law Community for co-sponsoring this program. This program is being recorded as a video podcast. Attendees will not have the ability to appear on screen or speak. If you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, button to put in the questions, and I will be reading them um, to the panel. Um, the panelists we have today are is an amazing group. I'm very excited to introduce them to you. Um, first is Evan Maroff. Um, he's a legislative counsel for the DC uh, Council Member Mary Che. Evan works on environmental and energy policy, as well as business, economic development, and consumer protection issues. Uh, prior to joining Council, Chay's, uh, Council Member Che's office, Evan was an associate attorney at a boutique law firm in DC, and Evan is originally from a small town in Nebraska. Thank you for coming. Um, also with us is Sally Greenberg. She's the executive director of the National Consumers League since 2007. Uh, NCL, which is the nation's oldest consumer protection nonprofit agency, works on several key priority areas, including fraud, child labor, life smarts program, healthcare, consumer protection, privacy, and food safety and nutrition. Uh, NCL and Sally have been instrumental in passage of key local consumer protection legislation, including the DC Consumer Protection Procedures Act of 2011 and DC's unit pricing law. Um, also with us is Carla McBride, I'm sorry, Carla, Carla Gilbride, I did it again. Um, she joined public justice in October 2014 and became co-director of the Access to Justice Project in 2021. Her, foc her work focuses on dismantling structural barriers that make it more difficult for people harmed by corporate or governmental abuse to use the civil courts to seek redress and change those harmful practices. Thank you for being with us, Carla. Um, last and by far not least is Naomi Claxton. She's a consumer protection and enforcement attorney and advocate, coach, mentor, and speaker. She is also a current board member of the DC Consumer Rights Coalition and a former DC Bar Consumer and Antitrust Steering Committee member. Her passion is uh, demonstrating how businesses benefit from transparency, and her focus has been consumer protection and consumer education. So let's talk a little bit about the bill that is the focus of our program today, the Sunshine and Litigation Act. And I'd like to read a little bit from um, the introduction uh, that Council Member Che had um, to the bill. It says a fundamental principle of justice systems in democratic societies is that court proceedings should be conducted in public view. Following this principle, courts in this country have long recognized a right of public access to judicial records. The United States Supreme Court has ruled that the presumption that court records are open to the public can only be overcome when there is a compelling government interest in restricting access. Yet every day materials are sealed that go beyond trade secrets, private information, or other similar classification of information. One such area where court secrecy has um, imperiled the health and safety of the public deals with settlements of issues revolving around defective or dangerous goods or conditions. So this important legislation we will be discussing today was introduced with the goal of prohibiting parties and courts from keeping information related to public dangerous secret, while also preserving the court's ability to protect information that is not relevant to the public interest, like personal medical or financial information or trade secrets of businesses. The purpose is to ensure the evidence of ongoing dangers to the public cannot remain under lock and key. So I'm going to do, I'm gonna send out uh, some questions. I'm gonna give you some questions to the panel. And um, I'd like to focus our first question initially to um, Sally Greenberg, and then of course, uh, folks on the panel, please um, add in your viewpoints on the issue as well. Um, so before we explore the nitty gritty and the language of the bill in question, I would like to hear from the panel. And again, starting with, with Ms. Greenberg, why the bill is important and necessary to consumer protection and public safety in the District of Columbia. 
Yes, um, thank you so much, Tracy. And thanks to the DC Bar Antitrust and Consumer Law Communities that are sponsoring this. Uh, I wanna um, uh, thank Tracy also for being an excellent lawyer, a lawyer's lawyer. She's represented NCL uh, in some uh, cases, uh, consumer protection cases, a number of them, and um, she is a terrific lawyer. Um, but we're so um, um, honored to have a chance to discuss the importance of this issue of secret settlements and in, in the courts and allowing those settlements to remain away from the public eye and why that is such a critical matter for consumer protection and consumer safety. It's also an honor to be on the panel with true experts uh, uh, on this issue, on this uh, issue of uh, uh, sunshine and litigation with uh, Naomi, Carla, and Evan. Just to frame the issue from a consumer perspective, typically a consumer sues a manufacturer for an injury or death that has resulted from a defect in one of the manufacturer's products. In these cases, the victim generally is suing a large company that can spend huge sums of money defending the lawsuit and delaying its resolution. Facing a formidable opponent and mounting medical bills, plaintiffs are often discouraged from continuing and seek to settle the litigation. In exchange for monetary damages, the victim is then often forced to agree to a provision that prohibits him or her from revealing information discussed during the case. While the plaintiff gets a, re a respectable award and the defendant is able to keep damaging information from being publicized, the public remains unaware of critical health and safety information that can potentially save lives. And even if the civil complaint and other court records may be available to the public, the publicity is usually minimal and not sufficient to notify the public and regulatory agencies or to prevent additional injuries. In cases involving dangerous products, it's often the smoking gun documents uncovered during discovery and sealed in settlement agreements that will adequately inform the public and regulators about a health or safety danger. As a result, without access to that information, it takes the public and regulators much longer than it should to discover dangers to health and safety. Furthermore, in most cases, defendants to continue to uh, uh, insist on uh, secrecy even after some of the information has become public. There are dozens of examples of products that have injured people where the information was sealed in secret settlements and went on to hurt thousands and even millions of consumers because they weren't aware of the dangers. And these include complications from silicone breast implants, adverse reactions to prescription painkillers, Park to reverse problems in pickup trucks, defective heart valves, side saddle gas tanks, playground equipment, nursery equipment, IUD birth control devices, tires and tires and portable cribs. So consumers are at risk every day from these secret settlements, and this pertains very much to consumers in the District of Columbia. Thank you for that. Um... Anyone in the panel have anything to add about why it is an important and necessary consumer protection and public safety measure for the district? Ms. Gilbride or Ms. Claxton, Mr. Morrow? Sure, this is Carla Gilbride from Public Justice Speaking and um, I wanted to just amplify and echo everything that Sally said about how important this issue is to consumers because the incentives within the context of a lawsuit when someone comes forward because something terrible has happened to them, um, you know, it is it, very much focused on getting medical expenses covered, um, getting some sort of compensation for the harm that they've suffered. Um, and in order to, to maximize that information, often one of the first things that happens in discovery is that the defendant asks the plaintiff's attorney to enter into a protective order saying that any information we share with you will be kept confidential if we designate it as confidential. Um, you know, there are legal standards for, for what is supposed to be covered by a protective order, but often when the parties agree to it and courts sign off on it, you know, the status quo keeps a lot of those do documents um, 
confined between the parties. And that goes against that presumption that court records are open to the public uh, that Tracy read earlier. And just for one example of that, in a case that public justice was recently involved in, the eShore birth control device marketed by Bayer in the early 2000s, which was implanted in hundreds of thousands of, of people. And within you know, the first few years, Bayer started to realize that it had catastrophic failures. Uh, it involved metal coils, which could come uncoiled, and metal shards were, were, you know, floating freely within people's bodies, leading to hysterectomies, leading to perforated organs and serious medical complications, and, and even in some instances to death. And when several lawsuits were consolidated to address the eShore, um, you know, dangerous product. Under the terms of the protective order, 97% uh, of the documents that were exchanged and that were ultimately filed with, with the court in, in motions were under seal. 97% of those documents. And that meant that all of the details about the harm, about when Bayer knew about the harm, about you know steps that could have been taken to mitigate it were shielded from the public view. And you know, in some cases, you know, public justice has in the past intervened on behalf of news organizations, journalists, you know, other concerned citizens who want this information to come to light. Um, but we can't do that, you know, in, in the vast majority of cases where this is going on. And that's why the bill uh, that has been introduced here in D.C. is so important, because it will change some of those presumptions where, uh, you know, as, as a matter of course, so many of these documents are filed under seal and are kept confidential and kept away from the public's view. Good afternoon, everyone. Tracy. Sally, Evan, Carla, I am really honored to be on a panel with you all today. And I wanted to address the question very briefly from the side. I'm an attorney, um, an advocate, a, pl a former plaintiff's attorney and consumer protection attorney. And the fact of the matter is these bills have been introduced time and time again in multiple jurisdictions. And there are some competing interests at play. And the reasons that the, that the consumer education piece of this is so important is because in some instances, there simply is not an interest on behalf of the courts and judges to do the work necessary to make sure that there is not a big fight over trade secrets. And we're going to get to this later on. This this does become an issue, and I understand that. But the reason that this bill is so important is because it is far, actually far less broad in the first instance than many bills that have been passed. And because we are on the beginning, because of the opioid crisis and because of everything that has come out with Purdue Pharma and the Sackler bankruptcy, we are actually at a point in jurisprudence, in the legal community and in public uh, pressure that laws like this not only are seen as positive, but we're at a point where the tide is actually turning to where both sides are starting to come together and realize that there are that our interests are more aligned than they are different. And so it is so important that we spend the time to actually parse what goes into these bills, what the true effects of them are, so that they can be framed in a way that shows that it is a win-win. One, it is a win for consumers to be educated, to know exactly what's in their products so that they can make informed decisions or so that they can make sure that they get, again, as Carla said, in most of the cases that we're going to discuss, the harm was not merely financial. We're talking about physical, we're talking about in some cases death. We are talking about with the opioid crisis, generations you know, that were affected financially and in many other ways. And these are costs that society bears. So that is a primary reason why these laws, even though there is a gut check reaction against them in many communities, um, they're necessary. They're important. And when they're framed as narrowly as I believe the DC law is, they are something that should not only be seriously considered, but it should be a model 
for other states and even federal legis legislation going forward. So those are good points. And I kind of want to follow up on that um, because you mentioned that obviously these uh, bills that are stronger perhaps or similar have passed. And I'd like to um, direct my next question to Carla Gilbride. Um, I know that public justice has been working on these anti-court secrecy measures in other parts of the country. I'm curious as to who are the main opponents of these bills or these concepts are, what are their arguments against the bills? And are there really, is there really a lot of pushback or is, is Ms. Claxton right in that um, the more folks talk to each other, the more they realize they might be on the same page. Well, I, I do think Ms. Claxon's right in the sense that the, the public, um, th that some of the recent things that have come to light regarding opioids and the, the length of time, you know, that the truth was known, you know, internally about how dangerous they were, but was uh kept from from public view also through secret settlements and sealing you know has sort of changed a lot of public sentiment on this topic but unfortunately i wish it were true that there was not um widespread or or you know um continued opposition um but there does continue to be opposition to to reforms to to bills that would sort of change the standard for when um, information regarding public health and safety can be sealed, whether through a settlement or court order. Um, and the, largely that opposition comes from industry and from, I think, sometimes, you know, a misunderstanding or um, overblown concerns about trade secrets. Uh, the term trade secret is is a defined term, and uh, you know that that's true in most jurisdictions. It's true in D.C., and there are protections and carve outs that would allow a true trade secret, something that would be competitively harmful, if you know competitors gained access to it through it being included in the public record. Um, that 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 sort of proprietary information, the prototypical example that people often give when we're discussing trade secrets is the formula for Coke, right? Okay. Something that's intellectual property that would be damaging to a business if it if it became publicly known um, in, in terms of, you know, competitive harm, because it is it's something that is, is um, you know, within the um, province intellectual property um, of the business. That is different from things that are harmful that may may indeed be harmful to a business's bottom line because they involve um, embarrassing revelations about, for example, you know, um, knowing about a danger and not uh, acting promptly to address it. Of course, that could be damaging for that information uh, to come to light, but it's not proprietary. It's not a trade secret. Uh, it simply doesn't, you know, it's, it's sort of reputationally harmful uh, for that information to come to light. And so, actually under existing case law, uh, if you look at what are, what are the standards for something that should be uh, protected from disclosure, uh, just under the federal rules of civil procedure and analogous case, you know, state court rules, embarrassment, um, harm to reputation, those are not sufficient justifications even under existing law. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the kind of the, the um, incentive structure of litigation that people have been describing means that those things are often the basis for documents being declared confidential and, and you know, uh, kept under wraps, just so that, because plaintiff's counsel want access to the information, they want access to the documents, they want to, you know, settle the case on favorable terms, and sometimes, it, you know, the exchange for that um, for, for getting those things, for getting access to the documents or for securing the settlement is agreeing to this overbroad confidentiality. So, um, you know, that this, I think a misunderstanding of what qualifies as a true trade secret versus, you know, sort of its reputational harm concept is what has under, under um, girded or, or been the um, reason for some of the opposition from business groups that that these legislative efforts have faced in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, Sally, Evan, Naomi, anything you would like to add about 
the, the nature of opposition? Uh, I did happen to um, uh, note a firm uh, advising clients uh, under the Florida Act uh, with some takeaways about the Florida Sunshine and Litigation Act, it's FSLA. Um, the uh, a public hazard determination, they warn their um, clients uh, a public hazard determination under the Florida Sunshine and Litigation Act can be catastrophic for the case and other matters alleging defects in the same product. A defendant may therefore need to decide whether to voluntarily waive confidentiality and avoid, avoid an F, FSLA determination or risk the product being branded a public hazard. It, it gives you a little window into what they're thinking and what they're advising their clients. Goodyear Tires and Ford Explorers got the pub, public hazard designation, they tell, they tell clients. Uh, and, and although there are substantial questions as to uh, Florida's con the law's constitutionality, no Florida court has held the FSLA unconstitutional. Um, and then they, lastly, they say plaintiffs who are familiar with um, the Florida law may attempt to use it as leverage. Um, so I thought that was a, a little interesting glimpse into the thinking uh, from the defendant perspective on uh, doing everything you can not to have your product declared a public hazard and that the courts are going to favor, um, um, are, are disfavor, um, how do they state it here? They disfavor confidentiality. So we're hoping that the, dis, uh, the DC Sunshine and Litigation uh, Act will have the same impact that they will, uh, we will have a disfavoring. And I know the wording is different in our statute. Maybe Naomi, I know she knows these, uh, these uh, bills and, and laws and, and probably Carla does as well um, have, because they're litigators. Uh, uh, we're hoping though the impact will have a similar effect in the District of Columbia to the one that's described uh, for the Florida Sunshine and Litigation Act. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Maroff, um, I wanted to pose this question to you, is, which is, you know, what prompted Council Member Che and um, the co-sponsoring council members to draft this bill? Why now? What was the impetus behind this bill? And, um, you know, whatever you're obviously free to share with us. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think the short answer is that Sally and public justice came to us and, and proposed it. But, you know, uh, the longer answer is, you know, my boss has, uh, she's been on the DC Council for 16 years. She spent a lot of that time uh, working on consumer protection issues. Uh, and, and this seemed like a fairly common sense uh, consumer protection uh, issue that we should, we should do something about, um, you know, the Trial Lawyers Association uh, supported it. Uh, we haven't heard a lot of opposition yet, um, but you know, really, it's it, it's it's what everybody's been talking about so far. You know, it, I I think it's easy for judges and lawyers to uh, go farther than necessary when they're trying to protect documents and uh, end up doing things that actually end up harming the public or allowing public harms to continue for much longer than they need to. Um, and, and so this would basically direct judges to say, you know, uh, the public interest here outweighs whatever private interest there might be. And so you have to be very careful about what, what you're allowing to be sealed in a case. So one of the questions, I guess it's a follow-up on that is, you know, we mentioned or Sally mentioned the Florida um, and for those that um, are uh, in the audience, um, the, there are similar statutes that have been passed in Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas, Virginia, and Washington. And so just to give everyone context, this DC bill is not, you know, sitting out there, um, you know, treading new ground. Um, and to what extent uh, were the pendants or the, the fact of these other bills and the fact that it hadn't caused the sky to fall in these other states, how did that bear on the willingness of the council members to support this bill? Yeah, I, I, that, was, that was really important to my boss. You know, like the first thing she said when I 
talked to her about the bill was, well, the first thing she said was, it, it sounds like a good idea. And the second thing she said was, you know, has, has there been any outcry or any big problem caused by this in other states? Are other states doing this? Um, and so, you know, we looked into it. We talked to public justice about that and we haven't heard of anything. So that was, a you know, a, a big, uh, you know, that, that, that got her and I think her colleagues a lot more comfortable with it. Okay. Um, so I'd like to turn the next question over to um, Naomi Claxton, since you are a local practitioner. Um, what impacts have you personally seen in your cases um, on public safety due to uh, local settlements that have such co uh, confidentiality clauses to the extent that you're able to discuss them, obviously, since they have confidentiality clauses? And you know, how do you think that the Sunshine and Litigation Act would have benefited the public in DC had it been uh, law earlier? Um, so, and then obviously I would like to hear from everybody else given their experiences outside of DC. Um, thank you, Tracy. I have encountered a number of cases where we have complaints from what are basically repeat offenders. And we find out later from, you know, word of mouth attorneys who have worked with multiple people that they have represented other people, right, against this same defendant. And we do our due diligence. Obviously, in litigation, you're always looking for what has gone on, what has happened in the past. And in consumer protection litigation, that's no different. It may even be more so uh, because it's kind of evidence that this person was aware of what was going on and they had the they had the knowledge in advance so they should have been working on this before and in some cases we have found that there have been entire dockets where cases have just disappeared so not only have there been protective orders over the actual discovery in the case but the complaint is sealed so and, and, and I think you'll see this defense attorneys in states where these types of laws have been considered have written prolific articles talking about the need for their clients to make sure that as soon as they are contacted, if it is, you know, a demand letter, anything, they need to immediately do a non-disclosure agreement because they want to make sure that this information does not end up in public. And what that typically means is when complaints are filed, sometimes they are filed under seal. And in DC, I mean, across the United States, I mean, there is an interesting issue in California about whether or not their constitution actually um, contradicts you know, the right to privacy in all cases, but that's neither here nor there. I don't think it does because we know the Nixon case basically held that there is a right for, for the public to have access to judicial records. And we have case law here in, uh, in the district, in the, from the DC circuit, that lays out the factors that courts should use before they are making decisions to seal cases. And what ha ends up happening is there becomes a high incentive for plaintiffs to, to settle cases under strict seal because the defendants will hinge an early settlement on either sealing the entire record dismiss and dismissing the complaint, or they will simply say, hey, we are not going to discuss anything. They will continue to drag the litigation out knowing, right, that the information that has been pre presented is sufficient to settle the matter. And plaintiffs don't typically want to continue that, especially individual plaintiffs. Um, Carla and Sally know about the opioid cases and in a lot of large cases, especially in class action suits, there's so much information already available by the time those cases come that it is less of an issue. But in these small cases, the plaintiffs usually want to get out. They want to get their money, especially if it's a personal injury, deal with healing and get on with their lives. In many cases, they don't even want to talk about it. And in most cases, these settlements gag them from talking about it. And so we end up exactly where Carla talked about with Bayer and Assur. We end up in, you know, the opioid cases were very different because of the way the effect happened. But when when we're talking about smaller types of cases like Takata, like Bayer's Assure, like even even the um, 
the Volkswagen water pump cases. There were a lot of early settlements in those cases um, that, you know, plaintiffs had gone in and sued individually. When regulators get that information early, as opposed to after 50 or 60 lawsuits and while a class action is pending, they're able to actually go in and, you know, regulators such as offices of attorney generals, you know, they are able to go in and they are able to make settlements that affect a broader class of people, especially inside states and districts. So they're able to protect their consumers. So getting this information and having it available doesn't just help consumers. It helps regulators get ahead of these issues be before they become huge public safety hazards for the entire state. The district is small, but we still had many, many people affected in the opioid cases, many. You know, and I think that it is very important to remember that it's not just consumers that need this information. Because while there may be federal law that requires disclosure of hazardous substances, we know that most companies don't voluntarily comply. So the incentive is to de-incentivize making allowing hazards to, to remain in products a business decision. The Ford Pinto situation. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I just want to um, underscore what Naomi said about how a bill like this can really, and, and I think that the example that Sally gave about the Florida Sunshine um, Law and how that has sort of changed the thinking um, and, and based on the advice that's being given to um, to, to companies who may find themselves, you know, facing a lawsuit uh, regarding a defective product, because there is reputational harm. I, I was speaking earlier about the the reputational harm that comes from, you know, information coming to light in litigation that that maybe a, a corporation knew, but there was a you know a problem with their product and they kept it on the market or they didn't do um, more earlier on to to address the harm. Um, there's also, you know, uh, that that reputational harm is is factored in to the decisions that businesses make about how aggressively, you know, to to address safety issues, whether to maybe take something off the market, you know, preemptively to to do further study or to invest in safety. Um, and when the backdrop against which those decisions are being made is that, you know, there's a presumption that that these things, you know, may come to light more easily, that it, it can't just be sort of swept under the rug by a protective order if you get sued or by um, paying someone, you know, to, to settle with a gag clause where they're not able to talk about it. If that, that those sorts of um, options are less available because of legislation and the presumption is that these this information you know could become public um you know much much more or, or is more likely to become public more quickly i think that really changes the incentive structure and and, and can change the way that you know, investments get made, and that's going to make everyone safer. So both the regulatory point that Naomi made about regulators getting the information, but even before you get to regulators, you know, the businesses themselves figuring out what's what's the calculus here, and what's going to make the most sense, um, you know, to, to go forward in terms of how to deal with this product um, that may be causing problems, you know, do we want to try to nip that in the bud? at an early stage. Um, and so I think it, it it can really have profound effects on all of the the actors in the situation, the litigators, you know, the lawyers, um, what happens when there is litigation, what, where there's sort of that opportunity for public-private partnership between private lawyers and public regulators like attorney general offices and, you know, the business who, is, who are manufacturing and selling these products. And just for the audience to to, uh, to put the opioid issue into perspective, because we've mentioned that often, um, from the introduction that council member Che wrote, she says, as early as 2001, individuals and governments began filing lawsuits alleging that opioid manufacturers had misled doctors about the dangers of the prescription or prescribing these drugs. 
Um, but uh, however, because judges in these cases require that court records remain under seal, the compelling evidence of the manufacturer's wrongdoing of the dangers of opioids uncovered by litigants was kept from the public view for over a decade. And that during that time, nearly a quarter of a million Americans had died from overdoses. So um, the, the opioids, while we talk about it as, as being a, a pretty egregious example, that highlights the reason why. And obviously, assure by hiding it, you know, um, women's reproductive uh, abilities were impacted. And then you've got obviously the Monsanto and, and, and uh, the Roundup, which is still out there. Um, um, as well, continue, being continuing the, to impact folks in the landscaping industry and homeowners and consumers, et cetera. Um, thank you for that. Um, I would like to now sort of focus on the mechanics of the bill. And so for folks who may have the bill pending uh, open, I wanna pull up the, the provision that talks about um, what the bill applies to and it, uh, it applies to, um, it says, um, let me pull it up exactly. That it applies to a provision within or an agreement made in connection with a settlement agreement in a covered civil action that purports to restrict the disclosure of factual information related to the action. If it is against public policy and therefore it is void and shall not be enforced. So um, for folks, I, I wanted to have the panel talk a little bit about this, but to clarify, it's, this is meant to address the standards by which a court would analyze um, the confidentiality provisions and settlement agreements, not the general protective orders that might govern discovery. Is that true? And this is open to anyone in the panel. <laughs> I'll jump in. I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, you know, I, well, I am a lawyer, but I'm, I'm not, you know, a practicing lawyer right now. So I think others might have a, be able to answer better. But you know, as far as the intent, um, yeah, I, this this is meant to sort of add to the standard. I think in these cases involving a public hazard. So once a court determines that there is a public that a case involves a public hazard, then it has to make sure that it's also asking in addition to the other factors that it has to consider for any you know uh, protective order or uh, motion to seal it has to consider you know is this a, is there information in this uh document or in this case generally that might affect other 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 plaintiffs other people uh you know from the same uh product or other other environmental condition And I'll just um, kind of piggyback on what Evan said. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, but the law states, and, I, and I'm just going to quote, the court shall not enter any order by stipulation or otherwise that has the effect of restricting the public disclosure um, of a public hazard. And I think that that is not, that is very clearly not just limiting this to the protective orders in a case. And um, as I hinted when I started, I think that a lot of the pushback is going to be a little bit of the uncertainty here. But like Sally pointed out, these have had the, posit the, the positive effect that the, the bills have intended in Florida, which is to create communication, especially where it has been clearly defined that what is what we term PII, which is personal identifying information, trade secrets, prop proprietary information is not going to be disclosed. So we're, most of us are attorneys, we know that redaction can happen. We know that documents can partially be disclosed, but not fully be disclosed. So there are a lot of ways that a court could interpret this to ensure that the information that is disclosed is not information that should not be disclosed, but information that does not have the effect of restricting the disclosure of the hazard in, the, in, in whatever the litigation is. Just to clarify, Section 2A has the limiting language on settlement agreements, and Section 2B is the broader provision um, that says, you know, shall not enter any order or stipulation or otherwise. 
Um, realistically speaking, in, in whether in Superior Court and District Court, what kinds of um, settlement agreements would come before a judge's scrutiny to trigger 2A? So I want to defer to Carla on this, <laughs> but um, so the litigators here will know judges are not huge fans of discovery disputes. They don't like them. They don't want to get involved. They want the parties right to work together and to do um, what's necessary. As we know, and as the rash of litigation around these types of issues shows us, that typically is not going to happen. And a big, um, a, a major issue has always been what a company feels uh, it needs to be covered by a protective order before they're going to disclose it. So I think the types of things that are going to trigger this now, because of the fact that there is an impetus, and I do wanna, I do wanna tag Carla in on the California bill because there was a really interesting provision in that bill that I think, that I think may have been part of the reason that um, if, if for those of you who aren't aware, the California bill actually did not pass the floor vote in August. And the part of the bill that was interesting was that it would have created an ethical violation for an attorney to recommend to their client to require or to accept a confidentiality agreement that would have the effect, again, of restricting the disclosure of a public hazard. And I think that that would be really terrifying to anyone that's litigating. And I do understand that. But I think, right, where we are is is getting to that point because imagine that you're in a discovery dispute and you've gotten 5,000 documents they've submitted a privilege log right that has 80,000 documents on it and the judge is like you want me to go through each and every one of these eighty thousand dollars not dollars eighty thousand entries on this privilege log and determine which of these has the effect right of restricting public access to this information that is a public hazard. And I believe that that is where defense attorneys want us to think we're going. What has actually happened in states like Florida and other states that have this litigation is that people are coming to the table earlier. And again, it, it really is going to depend on your jurisdiction and how your judges are. But people are coming to the table earlier to discuss the documents. And I think you're going to get fewer like heavily detailed privilege logs because they're going to know in this case, I have to disclose these documents. I do not have a right to keep them confidential to me unless they fall in these certain categories. And the categories are going to be what Carla was talking about, where we always get into the weeds is going to be the issue of trade secrets and whether something is simply a reputational harm or whether it truly is something that is proprietary and would seriously harm their business, business and competitive advantage. And I think the burden then has to shift to the person who does not want the disclosure. And they need to be basically pressed instead of handing the plaintiff side or the government a privilege log. They need to say these documents are um, documents that we believe constitute our confidential and proprietary business uh, trade secrets. And we want the court to do an in-camera inspection and show and tell the other side that there is nothing here, right, that could be related to affecting the disclosure of this public hazard and the effect of a law or an interpretation of that law that does that actually streamlines litigation. It makes it easier for judges. It makes it easier for the attorneys. Now the defense attorneys aren't going to like it so much. So, and here we are, but you know, I think what we've seen in Florida shows us that these laws can work when the parties are willing to see 
and interpret them reasonably and the courts are willing to interpret the provisions reasonably in a way that allows all parties to have their primary interest and their rights and we, Carla you know has hit the nail on the head not a, re a reputational harm is simply not a reason to withhold a document um, and so if we're able to get to that point um, I think that the laws will become more mainstream and I wish more states would um, do what Florida has done I mean the effects there have been very good can I yeah. follow up and ask a, Naomi a question um, about something you said earlier about complaints being sealed? Um, I wasn't aware of that. And, and, and Carla, please, as you both practitioners and, and, and uh, Tracy as well, I wasn't aware that complaints would be filed and sealed. Uh, that seems very um, uh, against public policy. So can you, um, do you think this, uh, the the um, DC uh, Sunshine and Litigation Act will um, help address that issue and that concern. I think it is intended to, as Tracy pointed out, Section Two B. I think it's intended to address that issue. I think we would have to see what would happen in practice, but it doesn't happen a great deal. And typically speaking, it's going to be a stipulation, and that's what this is intending to in, intending, excuse me, to address which is the way that defense attorneys sometimes will con make settlement contingent on this massive wiping of the record that the case ever existed. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, that I, I agree that um, this legislation is intended to address um, sealed documents that are allowed to be sealed by court order. And that's, that's typically, you know, it, it varies from, court to court on what the practice is, but usually a court has to approve anything that's filed under seal, you know, remaining under seal. And, and often what happens, as Naomi said, is that when, whether it's a complaint or a motion or a brief, any sort of court filing um, is on the docket under seal, that happens because the parties stipulated in advance, you know, to do so. Um, as the terms of a protective order, as the terms of some sort of, um, you know, non-disclosure agreement, that some some sort of private agreement. But once it's on the docket, um, you know, the, the court ha has a role to play as well if it's approving, you know, a stipulation between the parties and, and this Section 2B of the DC, DC Sunshine in Litigation Act would address that because it's, it's placing an obligation on the court to, you know, consider the public interest and not enter an order by stipulation or otherwise, you know, that would, would uh, have the effect of, of keeping this information from public view. Uh, where a public where a hazard is involved, um, and I wanted to sort of address something else that that Naomi said earlier in terms of the, um, you know how how the amount of work with these these large privilege logs or re really what happens is almost a blanket designation, um, and how a law like this can change that practice, which is unfortunately you know, all too common in litigation, once there's a protective order, which as I said earlier, you know, the parties are, are eager to get their hands on the documents, they want to understand, you know, you know, what what happened in the case. And because, you know, there's a there's a cone of, of access, where if you're within the terms of the protected order, if you are the parties or their counsel, or, you know, their designated experts, you can see the documents. The problem is everyone outside of that cone of access can't see them and can't know the facts that they contain. And so people, you know, agree to these protective orders, hoping perhaps, you know, in good faith that that the designation of what is actually confidential will be made sparingly, will be made, you know, judiciously. Um, but unfortunately, many times it isn't. And many times you just get, you know, every document that that shows up in discovery has a confidential designation across the bottom of it. And then are you going to fight about that? Or are you going to say, well, I actually don't think that you know, these 50 documents out of the, you know, 2000 that you sent or whatever, you know, should be confidential. Uh, I'm going to go back and, you know, argue about that and then send it to the court and have the court look at it. That's, 
that that's a lot to put on an attorney who's also just trying to you know reach the merits of the case and and get a resolution for their client um and so you know that it it becomes that question of you're asking you know private actors to you know sort of also consider the public interest in addition to to you know their obligation to their clients and you know to to sort of keep the judge happy right because then this dispute gets in front of the judge um when the when having a law on the books like this DC Sunshine Litigation Act um sort of moves the the standard um, in a way that says, okay, now if you if you over designate like that, if you say that everything you know that you're turning over is confidential when it really doesn't meet you know that that test objectively, um, it, you're probably going to get overturned because you're you know the, if a judge ever looks at this, it's so far from what the DC law you know requires if this law gets passed that that's almost you know just just not good faith you're not you're not um complying with what the standards of litigation are supposed to be and so that sort of moving the goalposts you know or the overton window is another phrase i've heard used a lot recently uh for this of what's what's a sort of acceptable practice um i think can actually cause there to be less of this burden placed on the plaintiff's attorney who sees a whole bunch of stuff designated confidential, you know, probably a lot of that stuff shouldn't be designated confidential, but what are you going to do about it when you actually just want to, you know, litigate your case? Um, and, and I think that's really important for just um, setting a standard that's so clear um, and that's judicially enforceable. And actually, there's another provision in here that I think is important, which talks about interveners having standing to come in and say, if if you have reason to know that, you know, there's a bunch of stuff getting filed under seal in a case where there's a matter of public importance, um, you know, a, a product that's hazardous, an environmental condition that's hazardous, a member of the public can go in and say, hey, I think this law is being violated. I think, you know, there, there are, are documents and information, factual information in this case um, that should be publicly available and isn't. Um, and that's another really important tool that that this this that this bill includes. Um, and you know, for our purposes of public justice, because we often do represent interveners who are trying to get access to sealed material, um, that's something that you know I think is is very important to you know to journalists, to to good government groups, to um, you know organizations that that advocate for for consumer information and for product safety to have that sort of tool to, you know, um, push back the the curtains and, and shed light on what's going on in some of these cases. And, and for those watching, it's uh, Section 2D is the intervener, right? Um, I'd like to move on to Section 2E of the bill, which has uh, the definitions, the, the key definitions here, and, and it's uh, covered civil action and, and public hazard. And when combined, it's a covered civil action is an action um, with the, where the factual foundation involves um, or during the pendency of discovery identifies a public hazard. And the public hazard is defined as a defective product and environmental condition um, that has caused or is likely to cause significant or su substantial bodily injury, illness, or death. And so given some of the cases we have talked about um, and uh, it, that have, would have been beneficially impacted by such a uh, legislation, um, do you foresee that this law would um, essentially apply to toxic torts, environmental disasters, or mass tort uh, in the mass tort context? Or do you see the possibility of these, um, this bill having an impact beyond um, those types of cases. And this is open to anyone. <laughs> I'll just say that those are certainly the things that would come to my mind, but um, I would defer to the practitioners on whether there are other, other scenarios that might come up that might involve a similar type of situation. 
I'm just curious if if the if folks think that the standards and the case law that may come out from this bill may have a beneficial effect outside of this area. Um, uh, given that I believe the Nixon or the um, the DC Circuit bill that Naomi had uh, talked about, which is Johnson versus Great East, uh, Greater Southeast Community Hospital, um, it seems to me that, uh, and I've heard Naomi speak about this in the past, that sometimes all the factors are not given full weight. And I'm just curious that if, you know, if this bill has the unintended the positive impact of making sure the Nixon factors are actually analyzed in better and further and accurate detail and given the right weight. Oh, Tracy, thank you for bringing that up because you know that I love those factors. And I, <laughs> um, I, I think that that's the main reason bills like this are so important, right? Because there really isn't a ton of incentive as Carla said, for an overworked, overburdened attorney who's trying to get his client's case heard, going up against a mega firm, right, who's billing all of these hours and whose job is to make sure that they never see most of these documents, there's not a ton of incentive, even if they get the documents, to be fighting to make sure everyone else gets access to them. And so that's why the impetus has to go to the courts and South, um, Johnson versus Southeast Community Hospital laid out the factors, the need for public access to the doctor documents at issue, the extent to which the public had access to the documents prior to the order, the fact that a party has objected to disclosure and the identity of that party. And that's a big deal in, in what is going on in this bill, because now we are basically stating, even if someone objects, we now have third parties that are able to intervene and are given standing to say, hey, this is a matter that's affecting the public and therefore the desires, right, of the parties should be outweighed by number one, which is the need for public access to the documents. But then there's the strength of the property and privacy interest involved. These are also issues that are covered in the carve outs for trade secrets and, 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 and documents that should be confidential because they will affect business. But not reputation. And then six, the purposes for which the documents were introduced. If we are talking about a case that is about a public hazard that actually caused harm, physical or otherwise, to a person, and now a company wants to keep that smoking gun document secret, we really need to ask, this was introduced for the purposes of proving that this product is hazardous. And courts are really giving a lot of weight to the party stipulation that they don't mind, right? The court agreeing to seal all of these documents. If all of the factors were evaluated and with the language in the bill that allows third party interveners, we really get to a more balanced application of these laws. And that does, I think, spill into other types of litigation. Because I think what has happened is the overbroad protective orders have spilled into smaller types of, lit of litigation. Thank you for that. Um, so the next two questions is, as I like to, I refer to them as sort of the magic wand questions. Like if, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could, uh, you know, you were proposing a bill here or elsewhere. Um, in this bill, for example, the three exclusions are trade secrets, PII, and the amount of the settlement. And so how do you feel about the fact that the amount of the settlement is is something that we can keep confidential? And and I preface that with saying, as a, you know, I'm a class action lawyer, so the amount of the settlement has to be out in the public and be vetted and and reviewed by the class members and and objected to and analyzed by the court. So, um, how do you feel about the amount of the settlement being an exclusion um, from disclosure? And again, open to everybody. I mean, of course, if I had a magic wand, I would, <laughs> I would probably, and and could could um, have anything that I wanted. I would probably say, well, you know, that that's relevant information. People should know it. But I, you know, unless um, I, I think there are some times when when the the victim, the injury victim themselves, doesn't want that information to be a matter of public, you know, record for for their own sort of safety and 
security reasons. Um, but I think it's a reasonable compromise. I think really what, what this is getting at for the sake of the public interest is the facts about the hazard itself, right? The, the underlying facts about what is dangerous and how it could, could harm others. And so that's what we, you know, kind of had, had a laser focus on. And I think that's appropriate. Um, and I, I know that, you know, the, the amount when as a, as a litigator, as a practitioner, when I'm negotiating over settlements and confidentiality, you know, the first thing that often is, is requested to be confidential is the amount. And I feel like that's, you know, that's somewhere where we can meet in the middle um, and, and find common ground. I would certainly rather have that be confidential, but the underlying facts of the allegations and the, and the, you know, harm that occurred be, be publicly um, known. And for the, and for the, you know, plaintiff to be able to speak about what happened to them, be able to tell their story, what I find very distressing and what my clients often find very distressing is these gag clauses that say, you can't talk about what happened to you, um, which is basically saying you can't tell your own story. Um, and, and that's, you know, and, and if in exchange for being able to, you know, talk freely about what happened, you know, the one thing they can't say is how much money they got. I think that's, you know, on the end of the day, a, a reasonable compromise. I completely agree. And the one thing I do want to point out, and Evan, you can chime in with any background on this, but there was not an explicit carve out, but it is in not what is not included is injunctive terms. So if, you know, there was some sort of uh, the judge ordered, you know, the company to do something that is not going to be something that is, you know, private. And I think that is a win, a huge win. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I'd also say that, you know, this doesn't prevent a judge from requiring disclosure of the settlement amount. I, so it this just leaves it with the judge's discretion. Um, it, it, it just says, you know, you don't have to require the parties to disclose that. Okay, that's a good point. Um, and then uh, the, 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 the last question I have, or not the last question, um, the last magic wand question I have is, the bill has is not retroactive. And so it, in theory, you could have a case where a protective order had been entered and then there's a settlement after the bill hopefully is to, uh, becomes law. And so how do we deal with sort of this non-retroactivity when it literally divides a case? And then how do you generally feel about the lack of retroactive application um, given that our legislative process is obviously a lengthy one? So I'm in DC, so I'll just, <laughs> I'll speak on that as, you know, there have been so many cases where I thought, boy, it would be nice if we could just say, hey, court, unseal it. This should never have been sealed. Give us this information, you know, in, especially as a, as when you're litigating on behalf of the government in larger consumer protection matters, you may have five to 30 people who have suffered the same harm, but you're not able to get everything. I think having, and especially if you've already, you've already filed your case, you're on your way to settlement and you know that there are documents that would help your case. I mean, of course, it would be wonderful to have. I understand that retroactive effect is something that many, practically speaking, many people are going to disagree with for many reasons, one of which is, you know, people make a lot of their decisions based on the law as it exists when they're litigating cases, right? And that's why retroactive effect has to be analyzed. It has to be very clear. Um, that's a, a huge way of actually attacking, you know, a lot of legislation. So I, I understand why it wouldn't be, but where we are, it would be, that's, that's really a magic wand because <laughs> what it does is it, it gets you, it, it, it basically steamrolls some of these cases to settlement. So magic wand, yes, I pick that all day. Do I think it's going to happen? Probably not. I appreciate that. Um, so the, the last question before we get to any questions from the audience and, and, and folks should feel free to type in their questions um, now. Um, the, this bill will be coming up for a hearing on December 8th. And, um, you know, what should, 
proponents of this bill do um, between now and then? And how can they get involved? And, and maybe Evan, Sally, um, and Carl, maybe you'd like to speak to these this question. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in to start. Um, so I, you know, the number one thing is to reach out to, uh, you can reach out to me, our office, or uh, obviously this is with uh, Council Member Allen's committee. Um, so reach out to them, sign up to testify at the hearing or submit written testimony. Uh, you know, obviously the people here at the council who are working on the law, we are not out there every day dealing with these issues in the courtroom. So it's it's super helpful and important, I think, to hear from people who are actually dealing with the issues and, and who can, uh, you know, foresee better than we can how these sorts of issues are going to play out in practice. So I, I I would definitely encourage everybody to to do that if, if you have thoughts on on the bill and and if you disagree with how we did it you know because we're we're happy to fix things that people agree are are wrong or should, could be made better. I'm going to jump in for thank you for that um, Evan and, um, and and again thanks to Council Member Che when we came when we came to uh, uh, her uh, staff this is like got. Um, Council Member Che's name written all over it because she is a law professor, a uh, con law professor. She's a champion of good government, transparency, and consumer protection. And I have to say, and Evan and Michael's, um, uh, uh, to, to their, their, their great uh, favor, they both said, yep, this is something Council Member Che will like. So uh, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, outreach to the committee that Evan was mentioning, it's, um, uh, it needs to be in by December 2nd. I think it would be uh, really great to have, um, a, to look at your client list, both um, Carla and, and um, Naomi, and figure out if, um, if there are people in the District of Columbia who could have been helped and would have been helped had this uh, Sunshine and Litigation Act in, in, in DC been in law at the time that you were litigating their cases. Um, I also wanted to mention that there'll be three bills up that day. Uh, the hearing's going from 9.30 to uh, three o'clock. And so we're part of uh, another, uh, we're part of a hearing with uh, three other bills and we're just, they're just gonna roll them along. But it really is a, a day to be committed to uh, sitting in the, um, the hearing room. Uh, Council member Allen again is the, um, is the chair of the committee, but he's also a champion of this, Evan, is, as I understand it, his staff's been, been really great. Um, I also wanted to mention that I did a, a bit of a historical look at this issue because as a consumer advocate uh, and, and, and um, you know, an advocacy person as opposed to a practitioner, uh, we, I worked on this when I was at Consumer Reports. It was a very important issue, um, and that was uh, 15 years ago. It was a very important issue then, and I think the first time, you know, one could wonder why haven't the, why haven't we dealt with this on a federal level? Uh, and there have been many bills introduced uh, in um, uh, in Congress. Uh, Senator Herb Cole from Wisconsin. He was a champion of the bill in the 1990s. He um, there, actually, I think the first bill was introduced in 1974, but there was is a wonderful um, uh, um, committee report in the Judiciary Committee uh, um, under uh, Senator Leahy back in 2011, which talks about uh, all of their efforts to move forward with uh, legislation that will unseal a, a lot of these uh, legal documents that would have provided information to the public about, uh, I mean, the list of um, issues and, and victims that came before the committee to testify is really rather astounding. And the fact that this has been out there for so long and we are relegated uh, to state by state legislation, which could have been done on a federal level if we had gotten um, various bills uh, through the committee. And they got close in 2011, I believe the bill passed um, the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, but then it, it, it died. I think it died in the House um, it, it, or it may, it may have died in the, in the full Senate. But the list of, of products and hazards uh, and people who've died is really kind of frightening. And it, and it you know, uh, while I'm really pleased to say that 
I, I think we're on, on a very positive path in the District of Columbia. It's, it's sad that we can't do this um, across the country because it's absolutely, uh, uh, um, it's imperative that this information gets out there and it protects consumers. So I'm, I'll send a link, I'll put a link in the, um, uh, in the chat about the 2011 report. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham co-sponsored the bill back in 2011. I think we're in a very different era now, I, I have to believe. Uh, and, I, and I was told by um, John uh, um, Leibowitz, who was a counsel to Senator Cole, that um, Strom Thurmond was very um, interested in, in this legislation as well. So I don't know, maybe we're in a different era now, but it does have a bipartisan appeal and it's the right thing and getting the right witnesses before the committee is gonna be very important on December 8th. So um, that's some, um, uh, you know, th that's sort of my message. This has been going on a long time in the history of this is, it's sad that we haven't been able to get a federal bill, but we're very, very happy to be able to protect the residents of the District of Columbia. So thank you again, um, Evan, for your work on this and Council Member Che and Council Member Allen, who's also become a great uh, uh, champion for us. So we have uh, a question from the audience that says, if passed as written, would this law solely apply to private litigation? I think in terms of the settlement provision, that was that was the intent. Um, I don't I let Evan speak to uh, <laughs> anything else in the bill, but but in terms of the reference to um, that, that certainly, you know, private civil litigation is the context in which I'm most familiar with these issues arising. I know, um, you know, there are other requirements on what what uh, terms the government can agree to, you know, in, in terms of um, settlements. But it, all of all of my comments have kind of been been operating under that assumption. Evan. Yeah, I think yeah. the question is 2A versus 2B, and I think I think Carla's right is the government can't enter into private settlements, but um, the intent was the intent for 2B to be private or public. Yeah, I I, I think what we we had in mind was private. Um, I, I I don't know that we've really thought into it too much. Um, so I would be interested in what people how people read that. I guess uh, again the practitioners how you read it, but yeah. I definitely agree with Carla and Tracy, you know, DC has their Consumer Protection Procedures Act, which is what the DC um, enforcement offices use to enforce our consumer protection law. I think, you know, getting a provision that's modeled on this as an amendment to the CPPA would be amazing. But in most cases, um, the government is not agreeing to blanket protective orders. So. Um, I do believe that, especially with 2B, that is going to be limited to um, private litigation. Right, because 2B as written is just very neutral. It's the court shall not enter any order. And that doesn't really seem to intend to limit it in any way. And obviously, as you said, the, the government has a, a different duty to be as open. Obviously, FOIA and state level FOIA rights um, uh, are definitely in play as well. Um, the only other question we had was great presentation. <laughs> so we had a thank you from the audience as well. Um, if uh, folks don't have any other questions, um, we're at the 90 minute mark. I wanted to thank everybody for this very informative, very useful um, conversation um, around the Sunshine and Litigation Act, how it fits into the broader scheme of similar laws across the country and how it would um, beneficially impact um, the DC um, uh, residents, the DC consumers and the DC, um, uh, the DC litigation environment. 